This is the State Environmental Planning Policy, Primary Production and Rural Development 2019 New South Wales. What you're looking at here is Schedule 5, the Rural Land Sharing Communities. Now if you look at number one, application of the schedule, this schedule applies as if it formed part of each of the following local environmental plans and has effect despite any other provisions of those plans. Now if you go through, you see the list of all the council environmental plans that it applies to. On there you will see the Tweed Local Environmental Plan in two locations there. Now, get on to the next one where it says two, aims of the schedule. This is interesting in itself in the description. So what is the aim of the rural land sharing communities? This schedule aims to encourage and facilitate the development of rural land sharing communities committed to environmentally sensitive and sustainable land use practices by a enabling people who collectively own a single lot to erect multiple dwellings on that lot without dividing the lot such as by subdivision or by contractual arrangements and b enabling the sharing of facilities and resources to allow a wide range of communal rural living opportunities at a lower cost and C facilitating development on rural land prefer preferably in a clustered style without undue harm to the environment and with the, without creating a demand for unreasonable or uneconomic provision of public amenities or services and D creating opportunities for an increase in rural population in areas that are experiencing population loss. So before I go on to anything else, if you look at all the aims in the schedule and you apply it to Nightcap on Minjimbal and their DA 21-0010 and ask the questions, right, First of all, DA 21-0010, as it points out here, is not a single lot. It consists of 21 lots that people will collectively own, not a single lot. So there, in essence, first part of A, they cannot actually sustain, because members who buy into NICAP on Minjimbal will collectively own not a single lot, but multiple lots. And there is no aim within this schedule to provide multiple, multiple dwellings and multiple um, occupation on multiple lots. This is specifically for single lots to erect multiple dwellings on. So it doesn't seem to be consistent with A of the schedule in the aims. Enabling the sharing of facilities and resources to allow a wide range of communal rural living opportunities at a lower cost. Well, there is not going there is no planned offering of any opportunities so there is um, no ability to offer anything at lower costs. The only thing they may say that they're offering at lower costs is when they say that they will give lo lots to the tribal community and free housing. So the next one we look at, C, facilitating development on rural land without undue harm to the environment and with the, without creating a demand for unreasonable or uneconomic provision of public amenities or services. Now, it will cause undue harm to the environment. They are planning to displace a wildlife corridor, natural habitat for koalas, 
They've got an abundant habitat right now. They intend to shrink that hab habitat down, push them across a busy main access road, and to have them go between uh, the developable, developable lots of exclusive living on one side and bare open paddocks on the other. It's not going to suit koalas. It may suit kangaroos who can come out and graze on those lands, but it's not going to suit your koala and a lot of other habitat uh, wildlife that will, they're generally shy. So there are endangered and vulnerable species, 21 fauna and seven flora. And of those, there are a lot more animals that are involved. They're only looking at endangered or vulnerable species, not the whole ecosystems and how they will destroy those ecosystems. And how over 300 acres will be cleared just around as a building envelope around these exclusive use lots. That is undue harm to the environment, over 300 acres. But ultimately, in the end, what is 1,500, nearly 1,600 hectares of land actually reduces down to wildlife habitat that is under 300 hectares. Once you take into consideration that animals will avoid all the developed zones, how they're blocking off other areas of habitat that even though they're not exclusive use, they are blocking it off. So essentially, I will show you that shortly, but so can we say that this development, the aim is to do it without undue harm? I'd say no, you cannot do it. The current wildlife corridor, they want to reduce it and move it to a place where it will cause risk and harm to the koalas and anything else that tries to cross that busy road. Now then we get to the other part of the C question, which actually says, and without creating a demand for unreasonable or uneconomic provision of public amenities or services. At this stage, there is nothing detailed about what they want to achieve in the village. So essentially, they are providing no provisions for public amenities or services. So essentially, they will be creating an undue and unreasonable demand on services that already exist in the surrounding localities in the Shire or outside of the Shire in the Lismore Shire. They are schools, hospitals, um, ambulance, police, doctors, you know, anyone that's tried getting into a doctor recently would know that, well, um, if you haven't been a regular there, trying getting in as a new patient is very difficult these days. Doctors are on demand. So that is one area that they will definitely put a burden on existing public amenities or services. So we can see that even in C, they will be causing undue harm to the environment and they will be creating a demand for unreasonable or economic provision for of public amenities or services like schools, hospitals, especially the rural fire service. The thing about it was that Peter Van Leishout was actually required to keep a fire truck there ready for emergency services. And I think that that's a fairly large expense on top of everything else that um, isn't even being considered in this um, development cost when they're projecting these costs forward and telling people what it's going to cost. Of those that 37 million they project as cost, only, one moment, only an estimated 21 million is actually a cost that the developer will bear. That's for the road and earthworks and also the installation of the Telstra uh, telecommunication cables under those roadworks. The cost of the sewerage treatment plants, the water tanks and the solar panels will be borne by each investor as they move in and decide what they're going to put on that property and what 
um, that will be a cost that they have anticipated will on based on uh, I suppose you could say standardized information so they used a Talex system certain size water tanks certain size tank for uh, rural fire services and a certain amount for solar panels as an estimated cost of what investors buying in will be paying themselves when they erect these premises on the land that they have exclusive right to or used to and this will be after you have obtained your own soil test and wind rating for the area then got your plans approved and then constructed it according to Australian standards and provisions through the council so of the 21 million the other 15 nearly 16 million of what they project as costs for stage one is actually a projection of the costs that investors will pay when they go to construct their dwelling oh and that's plus gst as well so yes uh, nearly 16 million for investors plus gst so so far the aims of the schedule when you consider nightcap on minjimbal with a b and c it's not looking very good that what they want to achieve is actually compatible with the aims of this schedule so let's look at d creating opportunities for an increase in rural population in areas that are experiencing population loss well that for a start is actually we cannot even classify that that is even true because the area is suffering a high demand people have not got enough housing the only reason they're moving out of the area is because they can't find housing so there is definitely they are definitely not experiencing a loss of population in fact they are experiencing an influx of population on a constant basis that they cannot accommodate for the numbers that keep coming into the area people keep coming in they have to leave because they cannot find any permanent long-term accommodation so it will not be creating opportunities to increase a rural population where there is a population loss it will actually be creating an overpopulation in areas that classically only have a few hundred people not up to a thousand or over so by the aims of the very schedule that it does not appear that NICAP on Minjimbal actually uh, comply with the aim of the of the schedule and the only reason as the Tweed Shire Council do not actually allow rural land sharing communities in their shire and in their local environmental plans this condition that is been overruling local governments to go with state law is something that is actually taking away the ability of communities to actually self-govern and make decisions for themselves and when those that are actually in the shire are seeking to use state legislation they should actually be in line with the aims of the schedule i cannot see by my interpretation here of the aims of the schedule that they are actually in line with the aims of that of this schedule now if it wasn't for this schedule they would not be able to submit a development application at all because it is not permissible un under the Tweedshire local environmental plans whether it's 2000 or 2014 it's not permissible so if not under this plan if they can't build it under this plan it certainly can't be built locally under the tweed 
So everything that they're creating at NICAP on Minjimbal must be consistent with this state environmental planning provisions. If not, it is in breach of the aims of the schedule and it does not apply. And I would challenge that they have already breached the aims of the schedule and therefore they cannot apply the terms of the State Environmental Provisional Planning 2019 to their development. And as they cannot get it through the Tweed development plan, they certainly have got no way to actually explore developing it at all. But there were other things that we will explore now quickly. All throughout DA 21-0010, you can see that they have complied with the terms of this particular provision, the state provision, the SEPP 2019. So we're looking at number four in Schedule 5 which actually talks about the community permitted with consent. One, the consent authority may grant development consent to develop on land to which this schedule applies for the purposes of three or more dwellings if satisfied of the following. A, the land is a single lot with an area of not less than 10 hectares. The height of any building on the land will not be more than 8 metres. C. No more than 25% of the land is prime crop and pasture land and no building containing a dwelling will be on any such land. D. No building will be on land that is a wildlife refuge, wildlife corridor or wildlife management area and the development will not adversely affect any such land. E. The development will not include a camping ground, caravan park, ecotourist facility or tourist and visitor accommodation except where otherwise permissible on the land. F. No building will be on land that has a slope in excess of 18 degrees or that is prone to mass movement. And G. The development is consistent with the aims of this schedule. Well, I think we've just established that, gee, the development isn't actually consistent with the aims of the schedule. But let's look at A to F. Now, if you will notice here, again, it brings out this, the land is a single lot. All right, this is de designed for single lot usage with multiple owners of that single lot without the necessity to subdivide. There is no provisions that I can see for multiple lots and it clearly identifies the land is a single lot with an area of not less than 10 hectares. All right, the land is not a single lot. It is 20 one lots that make up the development and the development footprint that consists of 21 lots well I'll look at that a little bit further on the height of any buildings on the land will not be more than eight meters well they've accommodated that in the design um, restrictions in people buying in so these things I'm not going to look too much at B or C because uh, to calculate all of um, C would actually be a little bit time consuming and be pointless because there is actually prime cropping and pasture land there and there is absolutely no plan to do any kind of farming whatsoever. They call themselves a farm but they will be doing no farming, no cropping, no pasture, no community gardens, nothing. The only talk has been about setting up businesses so that they can draw in the public and make money that way. So the issue of prime cropping and pasture is this whole thing applies to 
farmers in a large area. We are only dealing specifically with rural land sharing communities. And uh, so I'm, I'm not going to get into that. No building will be on land that is wildlife refuge, wildlife corridor or wildlife management area. And the development will not adversely affect any such land. Right, let me just show you one thing. Highlighted on this map is the orange area. That is the proposed wildlife corridor. It does actually go further over. I only went to the tidal border boundaries, not into the other areas. So this is only inclusive of theirs, except on this side where it breaks over and overlaps a little bit over here. But the green bit is the current corridor especially for koalas I dare say that they use through here because it's it's offering shelter on both sides and it's just nice for them to be feeling so safe up there in the trees and they don't feel vulnerable if they are forced over through this area they've got open grazing and vulnerable on one side and they've got domestication on the other side they're not going to like it they will not go down there and even if they did how many of them are going to be killed coming across here or cause accidents and people are killed so this green bit is currently a wildlife corridor they do intend to build on that wildlife corridor and it will adversely affect the habitat and the animals and wildlife there so even in the proposed moving and reduction of the wildlife corridor that will adversely affect the land it will adversely affect the wildlife and so they do intend to build on a wildlife corridor so they cannot comply with condition D and even the proposed wildlife corridor relocation animals are like kids typically very uncooperative of what you want to achieve them to do that's why you should never get them in show business because they won't do as they are will they They've got minds of their own so then we look at clause E the development will not include a camping ground, caravan park, eco-tourist facility or tourist and visitor accommodation except where otherwise permissible on the land. Well, there is an otherwise permissible tourist and visitor accommodation on Misty Mountains on the Kemp Cove Proprietary Limited owned land. But there is, even though the land is actually included in the development, there is no application in that development to specifically operate a camping ground, caravan park, eco-tourist facility or tourist and visitor accommodation. It, it is, however, stated by Planet that they do not intend to do, to do anything with Misty Mountains accommodations. But then they also misidentified the location of Misty Mountains. I'll just show you that. So I've been adding the traffic that goes up and down these roads frequently to give an overall view of what's actually current on the road and I've put in 15 campsites up here and crammed in people you know that one person might um, get a tent site and put two or three tents on it and four cars show up because they've all you know chipped in to, for the weekend or whatever there are trucks constantly going up and down concrete mixers and cars and everything but essentially the land that was identified as Misty Mountains lot and it was on was on a very thin strip going up the side here incorrectly identified by Planet as being the location for Misty Mountains but as I overlaid the lots as is said by the developers that everybody will get 2.47 acres of excuse, exclusive use area. Now they planned to put houses over here one two three four five six in amongst the yellow bits 
a misty mountain. There's a cabin here, cabin here, what I assume is the tent site area up here, and then we've got amenities down here. So in amongst all that is people's exclusive use. So I do not see anywhere in the current development application DA21-0010 where they're actually asking for permission to have this area zoned to allow for this tourist accommodation in amongst all these exclusive use areas. In essence, even though Misty Mountains does have approval, it does not have approval to operate within the envelope of this development. And certainly, the people that are going to be getting these exclusive use um, areas are not going to get their very good value for money. They're going to have people coming in and out all the time. Because, well, the photograph I've shown in previous videos actually covered a view up here of all across here. Cars up and down and hills, tents and everywhere camping all over here. So that was hundreds, not 15 that is permissible. And so within this 15 tent site permissible area, they say that they do not intend to do anything with Misty Mountains tourist accommodations. Yet, as I have just said, that they do not appear to be asking for permission to actually include that commercial business enterprise in these residential areas. Usually, you cannot build, you know, your industrial in suburbia, and that's how these can actually be around this. I don't know. But it is also the fact that they do not state that some people will have um, all these people coming through on a regular basis past their house. It'll be like, like what everybody else that lives further down Mandalay Road. It's going to be like a busy main road as you watch trucks and cars and everybody go up and down all the time. And their dirt roads enjoy the dust. Now before I finish up with the uh, rest of the SCP, P, I will just show you here that this is the building envelope of the exclusive use area. This is all of those ones marked in green are 2.47 acres. The one that is marked in orange down here cannot possibly be uh, any bigger than an acre. So in all circumstances I have done this across the property been very generous and tried but uh, in all circumstances like here there is no feasible way that these could be anything other than acre blocks the positions of the houses are determining the, blo the blocks essential location and I tell you that it did take a lot of time to try and make some of them into 2.47 when there was just no way around it. You've got corner blocks here that you could not help but make them a small block because they are limited unless you had a strip down here but then everything wound up over this way. Again here if this was made a 2.47 it would then actually affect all these other lots and their sizings. So it did take several days just to get this so that all these um, well lot envelopes would sit within what was realistically being proposed. There are 41 acre lots that could not achieve 2.47 acres. Now the promise of developers is that everybody gets 2.47 acres of exclusive use. For those 40 lots that cannot be built and contained within like these ones, do you propose to actually give them some land somewhere else, 1.47 acres somewhere else of exclusive use? Or will you reduce the price of the buy-in because they're only getting exclusive use of a much smaller area. 
As you can see, some of them, there was no problem fitting them in. But in no problem fitting them in, they also had to be very carefully considered and designed so that they would not stop ones on the other hill from fitting in properly. So as you can see, when you look at all these building envelopes, they block off the wildlife corridor. There would be no telling how many of those exclusive use lots people would fence, but the mere presence and habitation of people would put koalas off for a start, and there will be no clear path through. Even the areas down through here that are not being developed on will still not be appealing to them. The only area that will be left that will be appealing is this area up here. And I calculated that to be, hang on. So the entire development is 1,584 hectares. I'm going to round it off here. So let's say 85 hectares and 29 plus crown roads. Now of that, this area here is the only area that will be left as wilderness area once the whole entire development footprint goes down onto the ground and people start living there. The size of that wide area I could make a little bit bigger and give it much more generous uh, figures but I also wanted to keep it within a certain distance of houses because especially koalas and other animals will seek to stay that certain distance away anyway. So this white bit is actually 268 acres. So from something that was nearly 1600 acres of wildlife habitat reduced down to just under 270 acres. That is a huge, massive reduction. That is a huge impact on all the wildlife, the whole ecosystems. And there have been identified very distinctive ecosystems that will actually be very much impacted and largely destroyed by this development footprint. So, as you can see, this corridor down here that the animals now enjoy and feel safe using is going to be blocked off with all these exclusive use areas. And if people do erect fences, you have to imagine down here too, people have got their grey water systems running grey water off and you know there could be any number of things that actually are going to deter animals from coming in. On the other hand, there will be ones that you will attract. You may attract dingoes, you may attract the bush turkeys and, well, who knows what else, but I certainly know that you're going to attract old ratters. Ratters is going to love it because wherever humans are, you know, rats are like ants, they'll always show up. And they're going to increase in number and so are the big pythons that love eating all those big ratters. <laughs> so, yeah, just something to consider when you have no natural predators in the environment. But, but there is also the fact that foxes have actually been witnessed in this area. So foxes could actually play a part in helping to keep down your rat problem. But I wouldn't suggest anyone would be wanting to look at too many chickens running free. Not that I believe many vegans are actually going to want to have chickens for eggs anyway, but those that would have chickens will need to look after them because there's lots of things out there in the environment. The fox, the snake, <laughs> the dingoes, you know, they're all going to go for those chickens. So, you know, maybe not the best area to even think about having chickens anyway. So if we go back to the State Environment Planning Provisions of 2019 for New South Wales, we can see that many of the conditions in 4.1 are actually also not met by the development of Nightcap on Minjimbal. Yes, they are certainly looking at um, the height of buildings, C is not relevant, and
and they've certainly considered the slope of 18 degrees but it is not consistent with the aims of the schedule it is including an eco tourist visitor accommodation that isn't actually part of the actual development so it is not in that sense otherwise permissible on the land and it is going to be building on a wildlife corridor and it will adversely affect the land as I said in essence it will greatly reduce the amount of natural habitat for all the wildlife and then we've got up here the land is a single lot which it is not it is um, 21 lots so it cannot meet certain conditions of number four now these sections here I am not going to go into t um, today I want to go on to this one density of development now it says here the consent authority must not grant consent to development under this schedule if the development would result in more than the following number of dwellings on the land so if you look at the calculations in a and the calculations in b right so if you've got a small area in a it actually calculates that if your land is smaller than 210 you can end up having 54 dwellings on it if your land is greater than 210 you can have your 54 dwellings plus one dwelling for every six hectares greater than that 210 up to a maximum of 80 dwellings so condition a does not apply to the NICAP or Minjimbal development only condition B does because the development it says up here if the development not if each lot that constitutes the development the development is actually made up of 21 lots and yet it is clearly identified that it is laying out that the development consists of one lot so what they are proposing in putting 21 lots into one single development would still apply if you could get multiple lots if it made accommodation for that in this consent which I do not see consent for the use of multiple lots I see for the consent of use of a single lot with multiple owners but not multiple lots with multiple owners so if we are to look at these conditions we can only look at it in the terms of B and B says that no more than 80 dwellings can actually be erected on the development it doesn't matter that their development is consisting of 21 lots or one lot the development is 21 lots and all on, on all those 21 lots the maximum number of dwellings is 80 now even if you did it on a generous calculation and extended out all the acreage to give them six one every six hectares it falls a hundred short of the 392 coming in at 293 actually I think it was that uh, or 283 can't remember from off the top of my head but it fell very far short of the proposed 392 now the proposed 392 lots that make up dwelling sites that make up this development it's irrelevant that they're spread out over 21 lots for the understanding of this it is actually deemed that the development consists of one lot if you've jigsaw puzzled it together with 21 pieces that's your problem you can still only have a maximum of 80 dwellings on all of that land so for your 1584 plus acres with your 29 in crown land you can still only have 80 dwellings 
the only way that you could actually exceed your 80 dwellings, well, you can't exceed them, would be to actually have separate developments, to have a, a maximum amount of land in one development and then do another development that can then utilise taking it out to the maximum 80 dwellings and do it that way. But to do it that way, you would need at least three development applications and three developments. Now, from what I'm looking at here, and please, anyone, feel free to correct me. If you can interpret this in a way which actually gives the ability for someone to actually interpret the development as individual lots, that then on those individual lots I can have my 54 dwellings plus one for every six hectares. Because this is how at NICAP on Minjimbu they have attempted to put 392 dwellings on the ground where 80 is the maximum. There are is other issues to explore around the state environment planning provisions or policy, uh, but I think that uh, I've discussed enough here. I've given people food for thought in that if anyone can actually provide a legal interpretation of these of this document that could actually produce the legitimacy that they claim at NICAP or Minjimbal, where they say that they can put 392 dwellings on, when it clearly says that the density of development can't exceed 80. And it also says that the consent authority, which is the Tweed Council, must not grant consent to development under this schedule if the development would result in more than the following number of dwellings. So you ask yourself, would Nightcap or Minjimbal development involve more than 80 dwellings? And the answer to that is yes. So thereby, it clearly states that the con consent authority must not grant consent to development under this schedule because there is more than 80 dwellings proposed. It is clear, as is are uh, the other conditions within this planning policy. So if anyone could actually explain how NICAP or Minjimbal could actually get a lawyer who could actually say, I could explain this interpretation and try and argue it in court and try and win it. Um, if someone could actually figure out that kind of nonsense and explain it to me, I'd really greatly appreciate it because you know, this is a very simple document. It is not complicated. It also states that it is a single lot that makes up development. And even if the development consists of multiple lots, it is a single development. And the rules apply to the whole of that development, not the lots that make up the development. Anyway. That's all I'm going to say for today, and I'll leave it till next time. Bye.